a God-centered Christmas. And the first message we looked at was God with us. And we looked at 11 circumstances of life where God is with us. And then last Sunday, we looked at God in us. And practically, how does that work? And we looked at 11 acts of uh, the redemption drama. Now, today, we want to cover two more uh, aspects of this uh, God-centered Christmas. Uh, the first one we want to look at today is God for us. God for us. And again, this is incredibly good news. And uh, I want to begin by uh, showing two verses. <clears throat> one from the passage that was read to us, Psalm 56. Uh, King David uh, facing innumerable enemies. And uh, his life was on the line. And uh, he uh, makes this uh, statement in uh, Psalm 56 and verse 9. Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call, call upon the Lord, when I pray. This I know, those are words of absolute assurance and certainty. This I know that God is for me. Now, when you have God on your team, you have nothing to worry or fear. So because God is for us, the enemy's defeat is guaranteed. And then uh, we look at another psalm, Psalm 118 and verse 6. And uh, this is what the psalmist says in that verse. The Lord is for me. I will not fear what can man do to me. So you may be facing intimidating circumstances. Maybe there is a human face that comes before you that puts fear into your heart. But if God is for you, you have nothing to fear. Because God is for us, he will defeat the enemy. And because God is for us, he will dispel all fear. And then we come to the verse that I want to use as my text for this morning, Romans 8.31. Romans 8.31 is what I would like to call a fantastic promise. A fantastic promise. Now, look at this promise. If God is for us, who can successfully be against us? Yes, people can come against us. Circumstances can come against us, but successfully they cannot win because God is for us. So we want to explore this uh, fantastic promise uh, in greater detail. And uh, we are going to look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 has been called by the scholars the Mount Everest chapter in the Bible. The Mount Everest chapter in the Bible. It is an amazing chapter and you can't really uh, get it all in one reading. You have to study it for weeks, if not for months, in order to be able to fully uh, grasp all the wonderful truths uh, that are found in Romans chapter 8. How do we know? So here is a question. How do we know that God is for us? How do we know? And we are going to look at seven evidences from Romans chapter 8 that God is for us. Now here is number one. God is for us because he gave up his son for us all. I mean, that's the first evidence that God is for us. God gave up his son for us all. <laughs> and uh, we read verse uh, 31. Now look at verse 32. It's there on the screen for you. He who did not spare his one and only son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously 
give us all things. Now let's look at that verse a little in detail. God did not spare his own son. Now, uh, for those uh, who have uh, grown up uh, in the war years, uh, you will understand to some degree what this means. Because many a family gave up their sons and daughters in the course of the war. And sadly, those sons and daughters died in order to secure our freedom. And uh, we grieve their loss, but we also celebrate the freedom that they gave us. And it's very painful to release a son or daughter for the cause of war, for righteousness to win and prevail. In the good old days, there were parents who were willing to release their sons and daughters to the mission field. And when uh, these sons and daughters went to the mission field, uh, they didn't have any of the modern conveniences. And most of them would eventually die on the field. There are parents who have buried their infant children, young children on the mission field. I know stories. And uh, here is the, the greatest giving of all. God had only one son, unique son, one of a kind, and God did not spare that son. As one contemporary uh, song puts it, the darling of heaven. I love that expression. God gave the darling of heaven for you and for me. I like that word all. <laughs> uh, by now you know I, I, I have an infatuation with this word all. That includes all of us. All of us sinners, wayward sheep, children of disobedience, objects of God's wrath. So for whom did God give up his son? Not for good people, for rebels like you and me. So Paul is making a very beautiful argument. He is arguing from the greater to the lesser. The greatest thing that God could do is to give up his one and only son, the darling of heaven. Now, if God did the greatest thing, then wouldn't he also do the lesser things? So the second part of the verse says, along with him, with the Lord Jesus, graciously give us all things. All the things that we need for life. Uh, all the uh, basic necessities of life. God will give it to us because we have the evidence of God giving the greater that of his son. So these uh, remind us of the beloved John 3.16, right? Uh, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should never perish, but have eternal life. And in John 3, 17, we read, God did not send his son to condemn the world. We are already condemned on account of our sin. So God didn't have to uh, send his son to condemn us. Sin has already condemned us. But why was the son sent? In order to save the world through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus himself uh, made known his mission statement in Luke 19 and verse 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. God is for us. Here is the good news. Because God gave up his son for us all. Now let's go to reason number two, Romans 8. And reason number two is... God for us is for us because he has settled the question of sin once for all. It's, it's a done deal. Uh, the, the, the question of sin has been dealt with. So how was it dealt with? So we look at Romans 8 verse 3. And again, there you have that very wonderful word, God sent. The Lord Jesus was sent on a mission. God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful man in order to be a sin offering. So the Lord Jesus Christ took on a real flesh and blood human body, but with one exception. He was sinless. He was virgin born, 
he was sinless, but he had a very real body, like what you and I have. And uh, he took on that body in order to provide himself as the sin offering for all the sins of humanity. And again, we go back to the Old Testament, where innocent animals were slain on Jewish altars to provide a covering for sin. And the Lord Jesus became the ultimate sin offering. The Lord Jesus became the Lamb of God. The sin issue has been dealt with at the cross. And then we look at uh, uh, John 3.18. Apart from him, we were condemned. Apart from Christ, we were condemned. But now, because the Lord Jesus has died as our sin bearer, savior, sacrifice, substitute. I love all those S words, right? I drill it every time I proclaim the gospel. I'm never happy when I hear somebody share their testimony without mentioning those four words, right? Let me repeat it. He died as our sin bearer, savior, sacrifice, substitute. We are no longer under condemnation. John 5, 24 says we have passed from death to life because we have chosen to believe what the Lord Jesus did for us at the cross. And then uh, we come back to the Romans 8 passage where it says, who will bring any charge to God against those whom God has chosen? Uh, no one. Satan might try to bring charges, but these charges won't stick, right? Because why? God has justified us. These charges are not going to stick because in God's court in heaven, you and I are declared not guilty. We are acquitted because of what the Lord Jesus did for us and we chose to believe uh, in Christ as our sin offering. You're justified. And then the verse goes on to say, who then is the one who condemns? Satan will try to bring charges. They can't stick. I'm justified. And Satan will try to condemn me uh, before God. But actually, <laughs> uh, whether it be Satan or any other uh, person, uh, they can't condemn us. No one can condemn us. Why? Because Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God. He is interceding for us. Right now, the Lord Jesus is praying for you and praying for me. And every time uh, you and I commit a sin and Satan tries to accuse us, the Lord Jesus says, uh, yes, what Satan says is true. He did commit that sin, but my blood covers that sin. The sin is forgiven. Uh, the sin has been taken care of. And we celebrate, we rejoice because the sin issue has been dealt with once for all by the Lord Jesus Christ. God is for us. God is for us. So that's why, beloved, you don't have to work for forgiveness. You don't have to go through elaborate rituals or ceremonies or do tons of good works, hoping that they would, uh, they would uh, wipe out uh, all your bad works. Uh, just this week, I got an email uh, about a fo former classmate who had died. And the closing statement was very interesting. The closing statement uh, in uh, typical non-Christian uh, theology said, uh, may so and so uh, through a series of uh, uh, wanderings, uh, samsara wanderings, uh, may the person uh, uh, arrive or receive the supreme bliss of nirvana. So that is typically non-Christian theology. Hoping that because of all the good that the person has done in life and uh, through the short circuiting of the reincarnation process, that the person would achieve this state of uh, bliss, uh, uh, whatever they may choose to call it. But you know what? Our good works are like filthy rags in the sight of a holy God. They don't amount to anything in terms of our salvation. Our salvation rests securely in what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, the shedding of his blood, the rising again from the dead, authenticating what he did at the cross, 
and our reaching out to this savior in our sinfulness, pleading his mercy and receiving him to be our one and only Lord. And I trust that all those who are listening to me this morning and all those who would later uh, listen on the recorded, recorded version, uh, we, uh, I do pray, sincerely pray that this Christmas, you will open up your life and receive the Lord Jesus Christ to be your one and only Lord and Savior. Now we come to the third evidence that, uh, that God is for us. And this is a huge one. And uh, 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 this third uh, reason is actually uh, going to be divided into seven sub points. So tighten your belt and you're going to receive a theology on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is mentioned 20 times in Romans 8. So today sometime, I want you to read Romans 8, take a pen, and I want you to number the 20 references to the Holy Spirit in Romans chapter 8, the Mount Everest chapter of the Bible. God is for us because he has given us the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Earlier we said he gave his son, and now God has given us the Holy Spirit. So let's work our way through this. And uh, we are going to uh, bring up these verses on the screen uh, as we look at it. Uh, the, the, the first uh, glorious truth is that the Holy Spirit indwells us. So if Romans chapter 8 and verse 9 can be brought up, please, on the screen. Here we go. Uh, you, however, are not in the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the spirit of God, they don't, don't belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, it's a very simple, clear statement. If the Holy Spirit is not indwelling me, I'm not a child of God, right? The Holy Spirit indwells me. He has made my life, my body, his home. My body has become his temple. What an awesome truth. What an awesome truth that uh, this uh, sinner, right, uh, can now be indwelt by God himself because God condescends to come and live inside of the sinner on account of what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us at the cross. The Holy Spirit lives in you, right? Now we go to the second truth about the Holy Spirit. And uh, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Romans 8 and verse 11. I'm going to ask you, if at all possible, to memorize this verse. And uh, I had a pastor back in my Colombo church. He was not a great preacher. He was very good at visitation and very good at prayer. I always used to look forward to his visits because he would quote this verse. He never explained it. He simply quoted it. And before he prays over you, he anoints you with oil, he would quote this scripture, Romans 8 and verse 11. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, again, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Three times. In this uh, chapter, we are told that the Holy Spirit lives in us. The Holy Spirit raised the Lord Jesus from the dead. And if that same Holy Spirit lives in you, what is he going to do? He's going to give life to your mortal body. Now, what does that mean? The body that you and I uh, now have is going to one day die. It's going to decay. Right? It's a perishable body, your human body. Right? And right now, you and I know what it is to feel weak. Uh, we come down with illnesses, uh, infirmity. Right? Uh, sometimes we feel dead. We feel lifeless. We feel we can't take another step forward. We are tired. We are worn out. And sometimes we feel so dry. Right? So, what does the Holy Spirit do? He gives life to our mortal body. 
he, if I may use another term, he energizes our body. I want to encourage you to pray this prayer for yourself, for your family. Lord, I'm so terribly weak today. Holy Spirit, come in your fullness and uh, energize me. And you will be amazed how the Lord come, will come through for you. So God is for me because whenever my body tells me, <laughs> you know, you can't make it through another day, the Holy Spirit will give life to my mortal body. Truth number two. Now truth number three about the Holy Spirit. Uh, we come to verse 23. Uh, this has become very precious to me after my wife was called home to glory. And if you have lost a loved one who has uh, died in Christ, uh, this, has, this will become one of the most uh, precious verses to you. What amazing words of hope. Not only so, but we ourselves have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit and uh, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption, uh, for the manifestation of adoption to sonship. Now watch, the redemption of our bodies. The Holy Spirit one day is going to redeem our body. So the body that perishes, the body that is committed to the grave, the body that uh, becomes dust to dust, earth to earth, one defining day, the Holy Spirit is going to give us a brand new body. The redemption of our bodies. We love to talk about the redemption of the soul. But how about the redemption of the body? We have a glorious future, folks. God is for us because he has made wonderful provision even for this body that is subject to death and decay. You are going to have a redeemed, glorified body by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we eagerly look forward to. You are not going to get recycled. You are going to be resurrected. You are going to have a brand new body, age-proof, sin-proof, death-proof. Every time I visit the graveside of my dear wife, uh, this is one of the scriptures I comfort myself. <laughs> I look at the grave and I say, you know, she's, she's gone uh, earth to earth, ash, uh, uh, dust to dust. But one day there is going to emerge out of this grave a brand new redeemed body and how we celebrate in our hope. And only those of us who have lost loved ones will understand the preciousness of this verse. But uh, mark it in your Bible. One fine day you will come to this. And you will appreciate the wonder of this scripture. Okay, that's the third wonderful truth about the Holy Spirit. Now, number four, we come to verse 13. What does the Holy Spirit do? He is in us to help put to death the misdeeds of the body. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit, there you have it, the Holy Spirit. If by the enabling of the Holy Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So what is this simply saying? Every day, God is for us in our battle against sin. You know, you have temptations. I have temptations. The Holy Spirit enables us to win the battle against sin. The penalty has already been taken care of. But we all still have a sin nature. And the sin nature... Uh, is constantly, constantly waging warfare. <laughs> it wants to pull us down. It wants us to give in to temptation. But you don't have to. I don't have to. Because the Holy Spirit living inside of us, God for us, he will help us to kill sin in our life. He will help us to kill sin in whatever form it comes in our life. I like the way it's stated in this verse, NIV, the misdeeds of the body. The misdeeds of the body. The body by itself is neutral, but the sin nature inside of me uses the body to carry out its uh, uh, negative uh, things. Okay, so that's number four. Now we come to number five. 
in our theology of the Holy Spirit, Romans 8. Uh, again, I love this uh, verse uh, 14. God is for us because he is going to guide us. Okay, Romans 8, 14. So Romans 8, 14. Uh, how do we know that we belong to the Lord? How do we know that we are the sons of God? For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Again, I, I just want to say this. Uh, uh, not everyone is a child of God. Uh, that's a lie. You know, it's a nice thing to say. You know, you look at everyone and say, oh, everyone is a child of God. Everyone is a creation of God. But only those who have the life of God in them are the children of God. And so when does the life of God come into us? When we accept Christ to be our personal Lord and Savior. So if you are an authentic child of God, you, are, you and I should be experiencing the guidance of the Holy Spirit. God is for us because we don't have to go through life confused. We don't have to go through life groping in the dark. The Holy Spirit is there to guide us in all the decisions of life, major and minor. You will uh, be led to the scriptures and you will have the inner promptings of the Holy Spirit uh, guiding you in a certain course of action that you and I should be taking. God is for us. Uh, in the matter of guidance. And then we come to number six. Uh, the Holy Spirit gives us assurance that we really belong to the Lord. So verse 16, as it comes up on the screen, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, just, just let's park here for a moment. Watch that verse. Because you will have doubts at times, isn't it? Am I really a child of God? <laughs> Sometimes somebody might come and look at us and say, hey, the way you're behaving, you can't be a child of God, right? Uh, I'm sure you, you would have had someone say that to you. <laughs> or you may have entertained that doubt. Am I really a child of God? So here is the proof. God is for us because he wants to give you assurance. He wants to give you certainty that you're in the family. And how do we know that we are in God's family? Because the Holy Spirit himself, internal witness, he is going to witness internally and say to us that we belong to the Lord. You know, you and I need to daily discern the voice of the Holy Spirit. Now, you may ask, how do I know that's the voice of the Holy Spirit? When the Holy Spirit speaks, he will be consistent with Scripture. He will never say anything that uh, goes uh, outside of scripture, that discredits scripture. The Holy Spirit confirms the scripture to our heart. You're a child of God. You're blood bought. You're washed in the blood of Christ. You're redeemed. You will hear the Holy Spirit say that to you. And, but of course, your behavior has got to match uh, what you believe, right? And uh, so uh, number six, he gives us Wonderful assurance. God is for me. I am in his family because I have the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. Now, number seven, another very precious verse and truth. The Holy Spirit indwells to be our helper in our weakness. So let's read verse 26, uh, Romans 8, 26. In the same way, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. <laughs> Again, how gracious of God he knows we are weak, right? He knows that we are not superman. We are not superman. We are weak. We are fragile. We are vulnerable, right? We are creatures of dust. God knows it. So God is for us because he has provided the Holy Spirit to come alongside of us to help us in our weakness. Name your weakness and the Holy Spirit is there to help help you in your weakness. And then uh, something very beautiful is said here. We don't even know what we ought to pray for. Right? Uh, you have experienced it. I have experienced it. We are wordless. I experienced this a big way in the last week uh, of my uh, wife's life here on earth. I wanted to pray, but no words came out. 
my mind was a blank, numb with grief. I didn't know what to pray, what to say. And Romans 8, 26 came into play. When we don't know what we ought to pray for, the Holy Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. What a beautiful truth. The Holy Spirit is going to take over the ministry of intercession for you and for me. And uh, his uh, intercession is often wordless. Uh, it, it's expressed in the form of groans and sighs. That's what I did for a whole week, just groaning. I didn't know what to say. I was groaning. I went into a corner. I cried. I groaned. And in that whole process, the Holy Spirit was taking those groans, those sighs, and interpreting it to the Heavenly Father as expressions of uh, what I felt in my heart. So you and I will face circumstances in life where you cannot pray words. No words are going to come out. Your mind is going to be a blank. The Holy Spirit is going to be your helper. He is going to take over. He is going to pray for you, in you, through you. Wordless groans. So, the third uh, evidence that God is for us is because God has given us the Holy Spirit and we have looked at the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life and my life. Okay, crash course on the theology of the Holy Spirit from the Mount Everest chapter of the Bible. Now we come to number four. Number four, how do we know God is for us? God is for us because as his children, we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Now, this word inheritance, uh, let's read the verse first, okay? Verse 17, Romans 8, 17, as it comes up on the screen, okay? Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co heirs with Christ. So let's just press the pause button there. Okay. Uh, I want to sum all this up in one word it's the word inheritance. Okay. Now, inheritance uh, is uh, something very uh, important uh, in our society, right? Uh, like when I die, I want to leave an inheritance to my son. So I write a will. To my son, right? And <laughs> when I was growing up, I used to always wish uh, that uh, there would be a rich uncle of mine who would leave me a very big inheritance. Sadly, I didn't have an uncle like that, and I never came into uh, an in inheritance. But you know what? God is for you, and He has left an inheritance for you. So, what does this inheritance look like? You become an heir of God. And you become a co heir with Christ. Everything that belongs to God belongs to you. That's what it means. Everything that belongs to the Lord belongs to you. Or to put it in the words of 1 Peter 1 4, Peter said, You have an inheritance reserved in heaven for you. And then he uses three words it'll not spoil, it'll not fade it will not decay. And I might add, it will never be stolen. Your inheritance is reserved in heaven for you and it is undefiled, it is unfading, it is unperishable. 2 Peter 1, 4. Right? So can I, can I wrap it up in two words for you? Two R words? Okay, this point four. You are rich in Christ. You're rich in Christ. I mean, right now, materially, you may be destitute. You may be having a car that is 14 years old, like what I had, and it gave up on me. So I'm now looking for an alternate vehicle. And if you happen to have a brand new car that you're not using, just come and drop the key in my hand, and God will bless you. Okay? Uh, you may be destitute, but you and I are rich in Christ. Now, here's the second R word. You're going to rule with Christ. 
How does that make you feel? Today, you may be put down. <laughs> Today, no one, you know, takes what you say seriously. But there is come a defining day in glory when you and I are going to rule with Christ. God is for you. God is for you. What an amazing future he has in store for you. Right. We need to uh, rush on. So number five. God is for us, number five, because of the verse that you love so well. Uh, you know, honestly, I was tempted to just do a whole sermon on verse 28, but uh, uh, in context, I can't. Okay. God is for, you, for us because he has promised that all things will work together for our good. I don't have to even quote the verse for you. You know it well. Romans 8, 28. All things work together for the good of those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. Right? That's the verse you see on the screen. There are two conditions. Did you notice? Those who love him and those who are called by God. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about called in my next point. Uh, this is only applicable to those who love the Lord. Right? So what does this mean? Those who love God and doing their best to obey his commands, even though bad, sad, evil, wicked things happen, they will not touch your life. Because God will use them to ultimately bring about good both in your life and the world. So Joni Erickson Tada, that's the teenage girl who went for a swim, hit her head on a rock, and she became a quadriplegic and continues to live today having an amazing ministry. Uh, she said this, when uh, uh, somebody asked her, you know, what's the purpose of suffering? <laughs> she gave this absolutely brilliant reply. It's there on your screen. God loves what he hates to accomplish what he loves. God loves what he hates, natural disasters, you know, cancer, name it. God loves what he hates in order to accomplish what he loves. So what does God love? That you and I come into a personal relationship with him and we grow in that relationship and day by day we become more like the Lord Jesus. That is what God loves. So God uses everything that happens in our life to accomplish this wonderful purpose. God is for us. As you go through all the negatives of life, God is taking it all together and he's going to use it to accomplish uh, good in your life and glory for his name. Now, number six, God is for us because according to Romans 8, 29 and 30, because of God's declared purpose of his grace. <clears throat> now, again, I'm really frustrated this morning because I wish I could really elaborate on all this, but I just don't have the time. Okay. What is the declared purpose of God's grace? It's given to us in verses 29 and 30. Okay, so let's uh, look at those two verses very briefly, 29 and 30. For those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. To put it another way, the Lord Jesus is our elder brother, and he wants us to follow in the footsteps of the elder brother. Right Now, verse 30 gives us uh, a couple of more words. And those he predestined, he called. And those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he glorified. There are five words. When you read your Bible later on, take a red pen and circle these five words in verses 29 and 30. Interact with your Bible. Please interact with your Bible. Right? So, Five unbroken, unbreakable links in the golden chain. And this is how we know that God is for us. The first word is the word foreknowledge. Foreknowledge is to know beforehand. And as many commentators say, to be foreloved. This talks about a sovereign, distinguishing love, foreknowledge. I am the object of God's love in eternity past. Okay? Before the creation of this world, God set his love upon me. Foreknowledge. Then predestination. Predestination is to decide or ordain ahead of time what destiny you will have. 
predestined simply means God has a destiny in mind for you and for me. And what is that destiny? We have already mentioned it, that we be conformed to the image of Christ. That's the destiny that God has for you and for me. Everything that happens in your life is working towards that destiny. God is for us. God is for us. And then we are called in time through the gospel preaching. We are called. We obey the gospel. And uh, we uh, respond to the uh, call of God on our life for salvation. We are called, right? And then we are justified. We have already looked at that word. Justified means God has acquitted us. We are not guilty. We are covered by the blood of Christ. We are draped in the rope of righteous, Christ's righteousness. We are called, justified. And then we are going to be ultimately glorified. Glorified. Glorified means to clothe with splendor. Unimaginable beauty. I, I got a letter from uh, uh, someone uh, after my wife died. And uh, this dear sister tried to encourage me, comfort me. And she said, you know, pastor, uh, when you meet uh, Indrani in heaven, uh, you won't recognize her. She's going to be absolutely so beautiful, you will not be able to recognize her. And then an angel will come alongside of you and say, do you notice the lady over there? That is your wife. I was honestly blown by that uh, statement. That is glorified. Unimaginable beauty that uh, God is going to lavish on you and me in heaven. God is for you. What a glorious future we have, folks. God is for you. Right? Now, very briefly, we looked at God is for us. Okay, a fantastic promise, but now we have a frightful prospect, a frightful prospect. God against us. God against us. Oh, I forgot to give you number seven. So uh, let's just back, backtrack for a moment. Okay, so uh, number seven, how do we know God is for us? Because he has guaranteed our eternal security. Now, we don't have time to read those verses, 35 to 39, but just uh, look at what is up on your screen there. Nothing in time or eternity, in heaven or on earth, no force of evil, no demon from hell, absolutely nothing will ever separate us from the Lord and from his love for us. God is for us. All these force that will try to come against us uh, cannot win because God is for us and nothing can separate us from his love. Not death, nor life, nor demons, nor sicknesses, nor war, nor famine, just name it. Nothing can, nor, nor the corona, nothing can separate you from God's love, right? Now we come to this uh, frightful prospect, God against us. James 4, verses 4 and 6, okay? It's there on your screen. Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Did you hear that, beloved? If you choose, if I choose to become a friend of this world, by so doing, I become an enemy of God. God against me. Now let's keep reading. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So here are the two ways by which I can become an enemy of God. Frightful prospect. If I choose to love the world, and if I entertain pride in my heart, I become an enemy of God. So I had a pastor in my Colombo church, almost every sermon, he would quote 1 John 2, 15 and 16. <laughs> and we young fellows just growing up, my goodness, we memorized it because of the number of times he quoted it. He didn't want us to fall in love with the world system. He was a very godly man. He cared for us. And he would just quote this verse, right? Do not love the world or anything in the world if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And then the world is defined. 
the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, they don't come from the Father, but they come from the world. Now, next Sunday, I'm going to elaborate on uh, these two verses. Okay, so make sure you join us next Sunday for the elaboration of what does it mean to fall in love with the world and thus become an enemy of God. It's possible, very possible, frightful prospect, but I want to close on a very positive note. You and I want to be the friends of God, right? Not the enemies of God. So look what the Lord Jesus said, John 15, 14. So simple that you can stumble over it. You are my friends. How do we maintain friendship with God? If you do what I command. That's it. Abraham in the Bible is called the friend of God three times. And Abraham's life was marked by obedience. So when you and I choose to live a lifestyle of obedience to God, his word, without compromise, you become a friend of God. And then you can sing the hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would bless this word to our hearts. It's not a very palatable message, but Lord, a message we need to hear because it's in your word and how we celebrate the wonderful truth that God is for us, a fantastic promise. But Lord, we also cringe at the frightful prospect that God can be against us because of our pride and because we fall in love with the world system. Help us, Lord. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.